Are you considering divorce? Are you dealing with it now? Are you on the other side and not sure what comes next? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Divorce Do's and Don't Show with your host, Lisa C. Decker. Welcome everyone to the Divorce Do's and Don't Show. I'm Marcella Crape, your substitute host today, filling in for Lisa C. Decker, who's had a family emergency, unfortunately. Lisa is a certified divorce financial analyst, a real estate collaboration specialist in divorce, a certified amicable divorce professional, and the CEO and founder of Divorce Money Matters, and the organization that brings you this show, Divorce Town USA. Lisa and I have worked together for almost eight years now, and it is my privilege to fill in for her and be with all of you today. Thank you for joining us. So you may or may not know that March is historically the month where most divorce cases are filed in the court system. Talk about March Madness. So this month, we wanna help you keep your eye on the ball and your assets out of court. And to help us with this, we're happy to welcome our guest, Divorce Town USA family law attorney, Georgia Lord. Welcome, Georgia. Georgia practices law with the Decatur firm of Radford and Keyball LLC. She represents people facing such family transitions as divorce, child custody issues, child support, or alimony. Georgia is also a member of the Amicable Divorce Network, and she is proud to offer both collaborative and conventional family services to both traditional and non-traditional families. Welcome again to the show, Georgia. We're very happy to have you. It's great to be here. Happy to be here today. So before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of today's episode, can you tell us a little bit um, more about just the divorce process in general, maybe some general advice for someone who is either considering divorce or maybe in the early stages so that they can kind of get started off on the right foot? Sure. One of the things that um, is a good idea to do as you're starting to think about divorce or in the early stages is to gather up information, gather up things like bank account statements, retirement account statements, tax returns, um, look around the house, don't hack into anything, but go online to the accounts you can legitimately access and download the statements you can from there. Uh, get digital or paper copies of, of as much information as you can find and put it in a safe place just for safekeeping. The reason I'm saying to do this is, first of all, it's a good idea to keep those kinds of documents anyway, to some extent, especially when you're coming up on a potential big life transition. Second of all, that is the information, that's the data that an attorney will need to look at to give you an intelligent opinion about what you might be looking at if you go ahead with the divorce. Uh, and if you do proceed with the divorce, those are the papers that they will need to, to take the first steps towards um, getting it resolved. Excellent advice, Georgia. And actually, Lisa has created an, an ebook that will help you with some of this stuff. And we'll talk about that at the end of the show, mm -hmm. um, a resource that you can download to help you get organized. Um, it's interesting, too, that you said that about organizing your, your things in advance. Um, and you talked about, obviously, not hacking anything. But we want to remind people that just because you're collecting data or information or educating yourself on your finances, that doesn't mean that you can't have a collaborative divorce process. Now, one of the reasons Georgia suggested maybe keeping things in a safe place um, and maybe not telling your spouse if, if you haven't already told them that you're considering divorce is only because you don't want to inflame a process before it even starts. So That's if you're, doing, if mm -hmm. you're doing some of your homework, great, do some of your homework. It doesn't mean you can't have a collaborative or an amicable divorce process, but it, the better prepared you are, the better decisions you're going to make. So that's excellent true. advice. That's true. And, it's, and the next part of the homework that I would suggest people do is to, uh, I strongly advise people to get some advice from an experienced family lawyer before you make any decisions about, well, first of all, to the extent possible, whether or not to proceed with divorce. I know that's not always possible. Sometimes you're the one who gets told by the other party that you're getting divorced. But um, before you agree to anything, talk to somebody who can tell you what your rights are. Because it's one thing to decide that you aren't going to insist on your rights about this or that. 
but don't just give them up because you don't know you have them, okay? So, and in other cases, sometimes people hear from an attorney what they would be looking at and they decide, wow, I don't want to do this or I don't want to do it now. I mean, you know, for instance, if you, you may talk to, maybe you've been married nine years, you talk to an attorney, you find out that if you wait until you've been married 10 years, that changes your ability to collect uh, social security uh, and have much better terms for collecting social security than, than you would nine years. That's, that's worth knowing before you take action. Absolutely. Um, and that is also something that Lisa would strongly encourage her clients as well, because we do have clients that sometimes start the divorce process in different ways. And again, we'll talk about that at the end of the show. But sometimes clients want to start with their parenting plan, or maybe they want to start with their finances. Um, but as Georgia mentioned, however you start the divorce process, in whichever way that you go about it, legal counsel is going to be a necessity. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to go that traditional litigated route, and we're going to talk about that in a little in a little bit with Georgia. Um, but you're going to need legal advice because divorce is a legal thing. <laughs> it it has to take place within um, within the court system in order to be valid. But it doesn't mean that you have to have a lengthy, costly trial, and that's what we're going to try to help you avoid today. So let's talk about that now, Georgia. What are some pitfalls that you have seen in your experience um, that trip people up maybe at the beginning or maybe during the process that causes them problems they didn't need to have? Sure. Well, one problem can be, it's like you wanna make a decision about these things as expeditiously as possible, which is great. But on the other hand, sometimes people leap before they look, they commit to a bunch of things just to get it over with. Okay, I'll agree, I'll agree, whatever you want. And, and then later um, realize that, that they've gotten themselves into a situation that is very regrettable. But just a couple of specific points. Um, one is, um, and I'm, I'll just be real blunt about this, if your if your spouse has committed adultery, um, can that be relevant in a divorce? Absolutely. On the other hand, if you have intercourse with them after they commit the adultery, Georgia law considers that you have condoned it, you've forgiven them. Okay, so I just want people to know that. <laughs> Wow. No, that's important information. And and again, as Georgia mentioned, she's talking about Georgia law because Georgia practices in Georgia. That's true. But um, that's and true. from state to state, things the things can be slightly different. But there are states that are no fault states where adultery may not even enter into the picture because the courts don't even allow for that to be a factor. So yes. it is important to have these conversations with someone who understands local laws and rules so that you know what you should and shouldn't be concentrating your efforts on. Because how many times, Georgia, have you seen people, they're so upset and they're so angry because they have been hurt and they have been yes, betrayed. Absolutely. And yes, someone did commit adultery, but chasing that rabbit is just, may not get you anything. And in fact, could end up costing you time, energy, and money that you can't afford. That's, that's true. I mean, often um, the divorce process is often a, you have to make choices between, is there information I really need to get that I don't have that it would cost me a lot of money to get it? And is it worth doing that? What's the potential report? Are there claims I want to make that um, you know I can make, but they'll be expensive to pursue? Is it worth it or not? Sometimes it's worth it. You have to do a cost benefit analysis about that. And while just to another mention about adultery, and again, this is Georgia law, but anyone who commits adultery cannot is not eligible to collect alimony. So just, you know, just <laughs> important to know. These are, again. these are interesting facts. And again, these are good things to know for depending unless it's on condoned, what, you know, <laughs> unless it's condoned for what yeah. state you mm -hmm. live in. So mm -hmm. this is excellent information. Do you have any other specific, maybe common pitfalls that you see people or maybe just common oh, things sure. that people don't know? Give us a couple more. Sure. Another thing that um, most often a um, family court has rules that go into effect automatically once a case is filed. Um, not every court does, but some courts do. Uh, and uh, it's good to know what those rules are before you file. Because, for instance, if one of the rules, common rule, is to maintain the status quo. So, 
you need to think, well, am I in a situation I want to be stuck in indefinitely, you know? <laughs> so um, just, it's good to know your local rules or um, if, either to, to prevent somebody from doing something or just to know what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. Because um, another thing is uh, sending snarky emails, text messages, that kind of thing that, that can feel very satisfying at the moment, but it doesn't sound so great if it ends up being read aloud in court and everybody's looking at you like you're, you know, lower than low. And so always picture whatever you're doing, picture how it would look to the judge, how it would look in court, social media, be real careful about that, posting information there uh, about your divorce process, about, um, or anything that just, again, would make it, make you look bad in court. In particular, I'll caution people against something that is very, you know, typically very innocent, nothing you would think of as being bad, but it is, becomes a problem in some um, child custody cases is print, uh, publishing, um, you know, naked baby pictures or scantily clad pictures of very small children online. That is considered a, a very unwise thing to do nowadays, even if your intent was, was pure, um, which it typically would be, I would think. So, um, These and are, also, I want to go back. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead and finish oh, I was that just thought, and I want to go back and ask one more thing. <laughs> sure. Um, also, be careful, very mindful about how you talk about the situation with your children. You know, you should not make your child your confidant. You should not talk trash to them about the other parent. It, it, it's not fair to them. It, it's, it typically injures them in, in various subtle and non-subtle ways. And, if not, and it also typically makes you look very, very bad to the court, so. Excellent advice. I wanted to go back just a little bit, back up a little bit to where we were talking about being very aware of and knowledgeable as to what happens once a divorce case is filed. Um, and this goes back to, to comparing that collaborative process during mm -hmm. the conventional pro mm -hmm. process. So for our, those in our audience who don't know, the conventional divorce, the old fashioned divorce is you go to an attorney, you file, for divorce, mm -hmm. the other person gets served, and then you start a chain of events, typically on some court calendar. So different courts and different rules offered, maybe there's a set time you have to mediate, maybe like Georgia said, maybe there's a status quo that has to be maintained. Some courts have automatic orders that are entered the moment you file that will cover certain things as far as finances or children. So it, those kinds of things happen in the conventional way. And then most of the time motions go back and forth, discovery is done and so on and so forth. Now, in a more collaborative process, um, the filing may not actually happen until the end of the process. And why would that be, Georgia? Why would, why would two couples may want to work with their attorneys collaboratively, work with a financial expert, instead of dumping on their kids, have a mental health expert that mm -hmm. they are using for those emotional issues. Um, and why would that type of process working collaboratively, why would you save the filing until the end in that case? Well, and that's the cheapest way to do it is to, well, a couple of reasons. One is that you, if you can convince both of you to use a process that is front loaded with efforts to exchange information voluntarily and reach an agreement voluntarily. It, uh, first of all, you don't have to engage in the, the court process, the formal court process of exchanging information, which is very expensive and also tends to be very frustrating. Okay, in, instead of doing that, you can just say, hey, let's agree. We're just gonna hand documents to, you know, or email documents back and forth. It's a lot, easier, a lot cheaper. And second, it just, um, it lets you stay on your timeline uh, as opposed to the court's timeline. The court may be moved faster or slower than you like, but this gives you a chance to um, work out things between you. Now it can be if, so, if one person is really just not letting the process move forward at all, you may end up having to go to court to make the process move. But in general, it's just so much 
it protects your privacy more, your dignity more to work with your attorneys to try to reach agreement before you file. And that way, all the, the only things that are in court are just tend to be much more bare bones. And you all you have is a very quick pro forma hearing with the judge, typically, instead of having a, a hearing where you've got, you know, members of the public sitting there watching you and all kinds of financial information filed in the public record, it, you know, so it's a more respectful but process and cheaper. Could not agree more. It also mm -hmm. tends to be healthier. We've, you know, we're not saying that you're going to be friends with your spouse after your divorce, especially if there has been some type of betrayal, um, which very often there is. Um, but working, you're going to have to exchange financial information anyway, whether it's done cooperatively or whether it's demanded by the courts. Um, there are certain things that have, because divorce is a legal process, as we just discussed, there are certain things that have to happen in order for it to be finalized. So you can choose, as Georgia said, you can choose to do, do those things proactively, cooperatively, where, where possible. Um, and I want to talk a little bit, I don't know if you've had a case like this, George, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but we have had cases even where, where clients, they want to work cooperatively, let's say. In fact, we have a case like this right now, but they just cannot sit in the same room together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They just can't. And so in that instance, um, the attorneys are still working cooperatively on behalf of their clients. The clients really want to settle. They do not want to go to court. They just can't be in a room together. Yeah. So yeah. cooperative or collaborative or amicable, however you want to put it, doesn't mean I like you. <laughs> yeah, and, it's, and it, yeah, that's true. And, it and mediations, <laughs> at least down here, mediations, to, now this varies from place to place, but medi mediations down here, often the parties are in a different room or in a different Zoom room even, you know, from each other, because it just makes them feel more agitated and angry to stare into that other person's face. So, you know, let's not do it for a while. So, excellent. yeah. That's an excellent point, Georgia, is that we don't want to confuse a collaborative process with um, getting along. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we don't want to, we don't also, neither is a judicious process. You know, you can have two people that could have resolved things amicably that just didn't know any better. And they end up going through this expensive litigated judicious process unnecessarily. So it can go both ways. Um, let's talk a little bit about that because you were just talking about mediation. So we hear that we hear that a lot, you know, we're going to settle on the courthouse steps, you know, that mentality, we're going to mm -hmm. take it all the way till we walk in the door. In your professional opinion, when is the best time to try to reach an agreement with the other party? Would you say before you see a lawyer, I'm going to give you some multiple choice questions here, during mediation or after being in litigation for a while? I'd say it's, I, I choose other, I guess, which is as soon as as soon as you have the information you need to make an informed decision, you know, you, as, as soon as you have a sufficient amount of information to make an informed decision, because you can't ever have all information, but you also can do some things from the beginning to try to foster an environment in which um, you're able to talk about settlement, talk about agreement, even before you have the information. Used to be old fashioned lawyering, you know, nobody wanted to mention the possibility of settlement because they thought it showed weakness. But now we know you gotta, if you nobody mentions it, it's not gonna happen. And usually it's in the best interest of the parties. They spend less money. They're able to reach a resolution that keeps control in their mutual hand. Now it takes two. And sometimes you've gotten a reasonable person on the other side. And that is really, really frustrating. I know, but, but it's also incredibly frustrating and frightening to turn decisions about things that are important to you, like who gets how much retirement money or who gets custody of your children to turn those over to a stranger. A stranger, you know, a judge, I think judges typically try to get it right, but they may have different values than you, the two of you do. They may, um, you know, whatever. They only have a small snapshot of your life. They don't have all the facts. So so that's why I think it's important to be open uh, to cooperate with settlement discussion from the beginning, even if you can carve out some issues. Uh, the more, you know, car Maybe we don't have enough information about all the issues, but we've got enough information about this and that and the other. Well, let's see what we can work out on those and then we'll build on that. I think that's a good way to go. And sometimes the parties 
can uh, surprisingly often if they talk, you know, get some advice from attorney, but then they can talk to each other and resolve parts of things just between themselves, like how to divide up their credit card bills or, you know, what to, how to co-parent or um, how to divide up their furniture, whatever, things like that. It's silly to spend, you know, spend money to pay lawyers to do some of these things if you, if you can work with each other to work them out. Exactly. And even if you even if you can't talk to each other, um, but you do have settlement minded attorneys, I think that's a really important phrase for people to learn settlement minded attorneys, attorneys who don't want to take you to litigation, unless it's absolutely necessary. Someone like Georgia, who will say, you know what, let's, let's, let's agree to as much as we can possibly agree to. And if there's something that neither one of you are willing to budge on, well, then a judge will have to decide that one mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. Can you imagine two parents who love their kids sitting down, if not with each other, then maybe with a parenting coach mm -hmm. or with a counselor and, and working out a parenting plan that is truly in the best interest of their child or their children? How much better is that than I'm just going to let a judge decide and take my chances? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and and so what Georgia is saying here is very, very important as it relates to keeping the fabric of your family, because even when people two people are divorced, they're going to be tied together by different things. Your parents Maybe together for the rest of your lives. That's what I tell people, you know, and you don't want to impose on your child worrying about things like, well, I can't have mom and dad in the same room at my wedding or my college graduation or whatever, you, you know. <laughs> As my old boss used to say, you got yourselves into the situation. Don't look to your kids to get you out of it, you know? Um, Excellent advice. I think I like that. And you know, it's interesting too, Georgia, because right now um, we've had a couple shows on this lately that gray divorce or divorcing couples oh, yeah. over 50 is the fastest growing demographic right now for divorce. And that means that couples are gonna be tied together Maybe their children are grown, but now you have retirement accounts tying you together. You have social security tying you together. You have other things that mm -hmm. are going to keep you tied together in a certain way, even after your divorce, maybe not for everyone, but for more and more couples, they're finding that even though you're divorced, you're still having to maintain some type of a fabric of a family, whether you have children or not. If you've been married for 30 years, you know you're friends with some of your ex's family, with your in-laws, with their cousins, with their brothers, with their sisters. And so the more of that fabric that we can we can maintain and, and hold together through the divorce process, mm -hmm. the better off everybody's going to be, um, even if there aren't children involved, little children, um, oh, maybe yes, they're adult yes. children. Or even. some people, some people have been able to come through the process. I mean, some people have told me, I want to, I, I'm a friend with my spouse we can't live together you know we can't do that but i'd like to maintain a friendly relationship afterwards so that we can you know just sort of be if i go into surgery that he'll come with me or whatever you know that kind of thing and um that's true you know some people can others can't but it's great when it can happen when it can and and sometimes working with the right professionals and, and having the right mindset going in is is one of the keys to to making that work <laughs> oh yeah um, <laughs> i mean it's, it's very easy when people come in and they're real upset it's really easy to tell them what they want to hear to say oh yeah you can get that you can get that you can you know and we'll make them pay your attorney's fees or whatever but it one of the i try to remember to you know one of the things i like to do is to i don't like it's not fun but tell people not what they want to hear but what they need to hear because you need accurate, that's part of the service and lawyers should offer you is, you know, we're not your rah-rah group of friends. We're a reality check and that's what we need to do. So that instead of going ahead with these high in the sky ideas, you can make realistic choices because most settlements, most, most settlements, each person leaves feeling like, well, I didn't get everything I wanted, but I can live with that. And if both people feel that way, probably it's a pretty fair settlement. Exactly. And you controlled the outcome, not a stranger. Yes. Yes. That is very You true. decided what you gave up. You decided what you compromised in order to reach an agreement that you could both live with much yeah. healthier yeah. Yeah. in the yeah, long you, run. You changed uncertainty to certainty, you know, and that way you, you can go plan your future um, knowing what, what you have. 
Exactly. We're, we're starting to come to the end of the show, but I did want to talk to you about one thing because we are talking about um, encouraging couples to work together where, where possible, even if it's through their attorneys, they don't necessarily have to talk to each other. Um, but when couples start working co cooperatively or collaboratively, sometimes we find that they want to do this um, without attorneys. They're like, we're just going to, we're going to sit down at the kitchen table and we're going to work it all out. And then we won't need to pay anybody for anything. Um, Lisa, as a certified divorce financial analyst, will tell you, please, please, please don't do that. <laughs> there are financial issues that you probably don't understand, things that you don't even may not even anticipate that are going to come up later. And again, divorce is a legal process. Mm -hmm. So Georgia, please reinforce to our audience, even if you sit down at the kitchen table and work it all out, why do you need an attorney? <laughs> well, um, one of the reasons is because part of what lawyers are trying to do is to look for problems that could crop up later that you don't anticipate. Just a simple example is back before 2008, a lot of people had divorce agreements that said, uh, well, we'll sell the house and then we'll divide this and that and the other. Well, the pro and then the houses didn't sell. A lot of houses were underwater with mortgage prices the way it was. Uh, so part of what we do is look for what might happen and then put in provisions for if that happens, here's how we'll solve that problem. So that's one reason. Another reason is just, uh, you know, people assume things about what their rights are. Well, for instance, a lot of people think if their name is on a retirement, whoever's name is on a retirement account, it's their property and they just automatically get to take it with them. Well, at least in Georgia, that is, I think, probably in most states, that is not the case, you know. So um, I think knowing what your rights are can lead to a, a fair outcome. So very um, good. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that, again, because a marital settlement agreement is a legal document that is going to be filed in the legal system, you really do want to have a legal expert, a family law attorney review it, make sure that it is legally correct. Um, and you may want to have a financial expert review it and make sure that it's financially viable or possible to do some of the things that you are agreeing to. Some accounts can't be divided. Some people can't qualify for refinancing a home they want to stay in. Yeah, there are just yeah. certain factors that may come into play that no matter how well you're getting along, it just can't happen for one reason or another. And having those legal and financial experts in your corner to walk you through those potential um, hazards will help because it is very expensive <clears throat> to try to go back and enforce something, especially if it's not enforceable because yeah. it wasn't written yeah. correctly. <laughs> well, and even, um, I mean, this is, for instance, what if people decide, well, we'll divide up our retirement accounts by you can cash out half of it and then give it to me. That's like throwing away money because yeah. when you can do it in a in a trustee to trustee transfer and not have to pay the tax penalties and, you know, really to, to do things in a way that is most cost effective, that helps you avoid more taxes than you, you have to pay. Um, you can, there's all kinds of things like that that a lawyer and a, and a financial expert can bring to the table. Excellent advice. So here's the bottom line, folks, for today's show. We want to see you divorce co cooperatively and co collaboratively whenever possible. We want to see you settle as much as you can possibly settle without having to ever go to court except for the judge to sign your agreement. If that's not possible, we want to see you try to work together or find a settlement-minded attorney who is going to help you Keep your issues logical <laughs> and also functional and wherever possible reasonable to manage your expectations for what's coming down the pike. Look for somebody, make sure you have legal counsel and look for somebody that is going to help you get the best result possible and not just take your money. Somebody yeah. like Georgia. So Georgia, <laughs> please tell our audience, tell our audience how they can find you if they'd like more information. Um, especially if they're in the state of Georgia and how you help people and where they can find you. Sure. I um, represent people in courts in the metro Atlanta area. My email address is Georgia, G-E-O-R-G-I-A at decaturlegal.com, D-E-C-A-T-U-R-L-E-G-A-L.com. And uh, you can also, my, I've got a website at georgialordlaw.com where there's a, other information about me and family law, collaborative stuff and all that. So, Thank you so much, Georgia. We have really appreciated having you on the show today. We have just a minute to go. So we're very quickly going to bring you some of those resources that we talked about at the beginning of the show 
that are going to help you make the preparations that Georgia has so wisely recommended that you make. So I'm just going to share my screen with you very quickly. We're going to go through just a couple of things you can use and download and where you can find them. We first encourage you to go to divorcetownusa.com. There you can download this Divorce Town Roadmap, which is an ebook that walks you through some of these different choices, some of these different ways you may wanna start your process, all of them keeping you out of this bottom right-hand corner, which is Court, which is Bigger Bucks Boulevard and Duke It Out Drive. Next, in the Divorce Town USA Marketplace, we also have um, articles, eBooks, um, products, all kinds of things that we want, to, um, that we have found through the years that we want to share with you to help you have a healthy, healthier, happier process. And as we discussed, retain the fabric of your family as much as possible. That can be found by going to divorcetownusa.com slash marketplace. Divorce Town USA also hosts um, and the Divorce Help and Hope Support Group. Now, this is an online support group. It is hosted through meetup.com. It meets once or twice a month. The next meeting is actually this Thursday at 12. Um, and these meetings are always moderated by our Divorce Town USA professionals. So if you do have questions or issues or need a special help with something, there will be someone there that you can talk to and share with. Finally, preparing for the divorce process. Lisa Decker has created this free divorce financial fitness kit. It is available at divorcemoneymatters.com. You can download it there. It is completely free. It is an ebook. It is a working spreadsheet of documents that you will want to start to gather. And also some very important questions that you want to consider for when you do meet with that family law attorney, wherever it is in the process. Finally, what do we have next week? Well, we're going to be meeting with another Divorce Town USA lawyer, Pia, Co Pia Coslo, and Pia is going to help us choose the right family law attorney for your family. Questions to ask and things to look for to help you make the best decision possible. We want to thank all of you for joining us this week. We appreciate having you in our audience. And as always, we want to make sure that you join us next week and every week as we continue to help the world divorce one family at a time. Thank you, everyone.